by the way, I just filmed that. <laughs> song because as we progress through the music worship about praising the Lord, you know, just being an attitude of praise and worship all day long, a lot of times we are not, but we are need to be in the attitude of praising Him in a, just a constant attitude of that, and that would help us through many difficulties we have uh, in our lives, but in, none of that would even be possible if we didn't hold on to the Word, and that last song really spoke to that because it said we need to hold whatever it is. We must hold on to the Word of God. And brothers and sisters, today, we're going to uh, speak from the Word of God. Because in these days, uh, these last days, when things are so difficult and challenges are there to compromise, and we're seeing it everywhere, in the churches where they're compromising the truth of God's Word, we must hold on to the Word of God. Uh, we've been, we started last week in talking about knowing the Word out of Colossians chapter 2. Uh, and we touched on the first two points of that wanting desire to know that Word of God. We must have that insatiable desire to know His Word. 
before we can be aware of the warnings that are given, then the first of three warnings we touched on was a warning against the words. And we went through that last week. But I believe, as I just was trying to put things together this week, and just was so impressed that we needed to do something that we have done in our Book of Revelation study quite often, and there, and it's not for the same reason, but because of the day that we're in today and what this day represents today, well, we're going to take a parenthesis. <laughs> Remember that word in the Revelation study? It's not because uh, we're, we're seeing in Colossians 2 a, a parenthesis, but because I believe today in celebrating this Mother's Day, we need to touch on what it is what the virtuous woman is all about and really what virtue is all about for all of us believers so men don't think that if we touch on these passages of scriptures today that you're all scot free or all the man I can sit back and not have to write anything down not have to think about it anymore because it's all going to be on my wife all the moms here oh no it will not always be that way but I do want to say initially and right off the bat happy Mother's Day to our mothers I praise God for the mothers of this church we are so blessed to have you. You are precious. In God's sight is precious and ours. And we are so thankful for you. Uh, for the families that you're helping to rear while the fathers are working and producing the impact. Well, uh, we will digress, as I've said before. I want to ask you the question in dealing with this word virtue. You know, God calls us and calls mothers and calls fathers and all of us to be virtuous. But part of knowing the Word of God, as we we're talking about in that study last week, and we'll pick up next Sunday, in knowing the Word is to know what it says about being virtuous. Very important. Virtue is not just for women, but it's for all believers. And as I get into this this morning, a few passages we'll address. The first one is found in 2 Peter chapter 2, <clears throat> verses, I mean, excuse me, chapter 1. Verses 2 through 7. Well, this will lay some of the groundwork for what we're about to, to talk about today. Some of it, anyway. So let's look at 2 Peter chapter 2, chapter 1, verses 2 through 7, and let's go to the Lord in prayer before we read that passage this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for so much for this Mother's Day. We celebrate uh, the truth of your word. We celebrate mothers, but Lord, there's much more than that. <clears throat> There is a desire and need for, for people of virtue today that are virtuous. We just throw these words around and think that's old-fashioned. And uh, it's something outdated, needs to be updated uh, with words re like relevant or, uh, or tolerant. Oh, no, no. Lord, your word's very clear. Virtuous, a virtuous person is uh, described in your word as being really, uh, unfortunately, most unique. And so we desire that this morning that you speak to our hearts and help us to see how we are to be as we walk our daily walks here in this evil world. Thank you again for your word. The truth of it, the unchanging truth is found there in Jesus' name. Amen. This passage in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 2, reads, Grace and peace be multiplied through... To unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according in his divine power, have given unto us all things uh, that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. All right, we could spend a month of Sundays on that little passage right there. All of those things we are to add to our faith. And it's very important this morning to understand the foundation is the faith in Jesus Christ. Our salvation is right there. From that we build. And it's interesting the first word that's used here in this passage of Scripture to build on faith is the word virtue. And you know, you can't have, as you, as you uh, 
uh, progress down these adding two things to faith, you have to have the preceding ones before you can add the next one. Very important to understand that. You can't skip over and pick up one down the road here without having had those others built upon. There's building blocks, just like building a house. You add bricks and you keep building. You don't build them. Put the top bricks up and expect air to hold them up and build below them, do you? No. You build the foundation, then you build all these other things that I don't know uh, anything about uh, as you <laughs> build up. But you go up. You build on them and you end up with a, with a house that's complete. Well, how would you define the word virtuous? No, what is it? How, somebody give me a definition. What do you think? Integrity. Say that again. Integrity. That's part of it. Yes, it is. Moral uprightness. That's good, too. Purity. Sure, I guess. Good. 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 Yes. <coughs> yeah. Good. Really great. Thank you all. The... The definition of it literally is morally good, acting in conformity to the moral law, practicing the moral duties, and abstaining from vice as a, as a virtuous man. And also being in conformity to a moral or divine law as a virtuous action. So, you know how many times this word appears in the Word of God? Not very many. Not very many at all. In fact, we have seen it twice in the passage I just read you there this morning. Mm -hmm. There are only, there are only uh, uh, seven times in which the word virtue appears in the Bible. And really, uh, virtuous is a different thing, but we'll get into that in just a second. But the, time, the word virtue is mentioned only seven times, and three of those are pertaining to Jesus in the Gospels in Mark and uh, the book of Luke when someone would touch him, that he felt like virtue was going out of him. He expressed that. And so uh, that was found in Mark 5.30 and Luke 6.19 and, verse, and 6, Luke 8.46. But then the other times in which it is mentioned, interestingly, is in that great verse that we've used many times uh, in Philippians 4.8, because when it, it gets to that at the very end of it, it says, if there be any virtue, because it's listing all those things. Finally, my brethren, you know what whatsoever things are, are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, mm -hmm. think on these things. And that word "if," written in those old days, doesn't mean like I wonder if there's any virtue. I'm not sure. It couldn't possibly be no. That word actually means, it's a broader meaning of the word since, because, since there is any virtue, since there is any praise, because there is, think on these things. So that's how you build virtue on thinking on those things. It would just, um, I guess you would say, saturating our hearts and minds with these truths of God's word. And then, of course, those three times that we just had in this passage of Scripture this morning. So only seven times uh, is the word virtue used in the entire Scripture. Well, there's another word that goes along with that. It's called virtuous. And this morning, we want to address some passages about that. How many times do you think, do you think that a virtuous appears in the Bible? It's not as many as, as virtue. In fact, there's only three times that that appears in the Bible. And there's a fourth time in which the word is used as is called virtuously, as a, as a, it's almost like an adverb there. But anyway, uh, it's mentioned, so you can say if that is, then there are four times in the entire scripture. Let me ask you a trivia question this morning. Who is the only person in the Bible that's described as being virtuous? I bet this might be a tough one. No, a no, a person, a person named in the Bible that's described as per person. <coughs> Anybody? You might be surprised at this. Is it Ruth? Got it. Way to go, brother. It's Ruth. Some people might think Mary because she's the mother of Christ. And oh, she was a wonderful woman. You read Luke chapter one, and you see the magnificence that she praises there about the Lord. You think that. But no, there is only one person in the entire word of God that's described with the adjective as being virtuous. So let's turn there this morning. 
I want to turn over to this passage and uh, see a little bit about what uh, God's Word has to say uh, about this one. It's in the Old Testament, right after the book of Judges. <clears throat> and we'll be focusing in really on chapter 3, but we'll give you a little bit of background here. This is a, uh, uh, a story that has quite a, a few um, ebbs and flows, you might say, or mountaintops and valleys, but how God's Word, and it's really interesting to see how the, the seed of the Messiah runs right through this, and it so looks like it's iffy, and it may break, the thread may break, but oh, it doesn't, the way in which this happens. But this story here is Elimelech and Naomi uh, were getting ready to move to Moab because of the famine in the land, and so they were moving... These were actually Ruth's in-laws, mother and father-in-law, Elimelech and Naomi. And they had two sons named Malon and Chiliah. And so they moved to Moab, and tragically, what happens? Elimelech dies. So all of a sudden, here, uh, Naomi is left as a widow right off the bat. And uh, in the meantime, the two sons married. One of them married a, a woman named Orpah, and the other one married Ruth. And in that process, subsequent to that time, both those sons died. So here we've got three widows left together. Uh, Naomi and her two daughters-in-law. Not even her two daughters. And so the predicament came, what should we do? Well, Naomi urged them both to go back to their own mothers and their families. Which typically would be a normal thing you would think might happen. And so Orpah packed up and went her, went her way back to her family. And that's, a, that's the end of it, where she's concerned in Scripture. But Ruth did not do that. Ruth chose uh, rather to stay with her mother-in-law. And that's where this beautiful passage of Scripture in the first chapter, she writes, and uh, many, it's used in a lot of weddings. In fact, uh, uh, it was used at our wedding many years ago, 43, and almost, almost 43 years ago. But uh, Ruth said to her mother these beautiful words uh, in verse 16 and following in Ruth chapter 1. Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. And thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. What a incredible, beautiful expression. And I hope husbands and wives here today have no problem expressing that to, you, to your spouse. Well, what happens from there? We go on to, uh, and see what she goes to work, and the gleaning in the fields, and Boaz shows her favor. And, uh, is kind to her. Ultimately, in chapter 3, we find for this uh, uh, understanding of, of this principle of God's word of the kinsman of the demon. Back in those days, when a person was a widow, the next of kin, the closest in kin, uh, would, would take that person as their wife to raise up seed. And the first uh, child that was born would actually be carried the, the, the name of the of the father that had passed away. That's the way the custom was in that day. And so what was supposed to happen was there was a person that would come alongside and would marry Ruth as the next of kin to raise up seed to her husband that had passed away. Well, long story short, Boaz uh, really wasn't the next of kin, the closest. There was one closer than him. But as it turned out, that particular person did not want to, to take on this responsibility. And so the law allowed, if you go back to uh, Ju uh, Deuteronomy chapter 25, we won't do that today, verses 5 through 10, lays out the description of the kinsman of the demon and how that works. But nothing, but, but, uh, excuse me, I lost my train of thought. What happened out there? But, but anyway, uh, it, it lays out that. And so we see this happen here because that person chose not to step into this role. And so what Ruth did in chapter 3, with obedience to her mother, 
we want to look at that. It's really interesting to see, to see what uh, how these customs are and how God reveals and calls, allows this way to be described as a virtuous one. Let's look at that in uh, verses uh, 6 through 13. And she, that is Ruth, went down unto the floor, with the threshing floor, and did all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself, and, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thy handmaid. Thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy, skirt, thy, therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast shown more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou, in, as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. You know, she didn't go after the young guys that maybe were in better shape or, or looked better uh, uh, physically. Uh, Boaz and Bella was very old. He was up there in years. And yet she obeyed and did this. Back in the mother. And Boaz said here in verse 10, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. Albeit, there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then I will do the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. So here we find Boaz said that she was, not, not only did he say she was a virtuous woman, but I was so impressed that he acknowledged that all of the city knew she was a virtuous woman. Ladies, how would you like that to be said about you? Men, how would you like that to be said about you? You work, wherever we go, we're virtuous. Oh my, people today think about that system. Prudish. Well, God's word speaks different, my friends. So we find in this beautiful chapter, Boaz calls her virtuous and then thus fulfills his part of the kinsman redeemer. So why is this sequence of events so important? Why do we have the story in the Bible? Well, I believe it's very important not only to show the example here of these folks, but also to underscore the lineage of the Messiah coming right through this. Because had not, had not Boaz obeyed, then the, the, the line could have been broken right there. Because uh, uh, there would not have come uh, Obed, which was their son, would not have come then Jesse, who was the father of then of King David. So you can see right there, through that, it's very important to understand Jesus Christ's lineage through Joseph. You can find that in Matthew chapter 1, as it expresses that in, in verses 5 and 6. It comes through Boaz marrying Ruth, then they begat Obed, who begat Jesse, who begat David, who was king. You can see all the way through that. It goes all the way down in chapter, um, in chapter in verse 17, the knowledge is there at the end of that lineage of Joseph. That it ends up there at Joseph. And we've gone through that in detail in the past. Well, seeing this example here, then mothers and young women this morning, and a young woman who inspire at some point to be mothers. I'm sure you young ladies that would like to be mothers someday when you grow up, be older. Is it your desire to be a virtuous woman? Or is it your desire to be the most popular? Or is it your desire to be the most beautiful? The most liked? 
want you to be virtuous. Well, this morning I want us to look at what the Bible says because the Bible never touches on the importance of being popular. It never touches on the importance of being liked or the importance of uh, being the most beautiful on the outward, outwardly. It doesn't talk about those things at all. In fact, it diminishes those, beauty, those things which we describe a lot of times today as beauty. But I want us to look this morning at a great passage of Scripture on this Mother's Day found in Proverbs chapter 31. And here we want to, just to touch on three points this morning. Lord willing, in our time, one, one, the first one will be the virtuous woman described in Proverbs 31, then the virtuous woman praised. And men, you're part of me out of Ephesians 5 as we find the virtuous woman supported. So you won't get off the hook this morning. Let's turn to Proverbs chapter 31. It's a great passage of Scripture this morning. Let's see what God's Word has to say. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Her heart, the heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She rises also while it, while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. She considereth the field, and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth the vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk, her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is a law of kindness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her. Well, many descriptions of the virtuous woman. <coughs> So before we get into those and delve into them and see what God's Word says, do you desire ladies to be a virtuous woman? Do you desire them? I hope you can still say that at the end of this. Because this isn't an easy, you sit back in the, in the chair and fold your hands and do nothing. And I know you don't do that now. We'll go through these this morning just quickly. The virtuous woman described, the first thing it says here is the virtuous woman is rare. Look what it says. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? Well, you know, I was interested in that because I wondered why I didn't say her price is far above diamonds. I mean, in our thinking, we think uh, somebody had a choice of having a ruby or a diamond, they pick a diamond because they think it's worth more. Well, I got looking at that because I thought, that was interesting to me. There's got to be a reason for that. Well, there is a, an animal that lives over there, and it's in the water over there in, in, uh, in Israel. I can't remember what they call it. But it produces what's called, this may not actually be what we think of as a ruby, because in that day, in that land, when this was written, there was a rare pink pearl 
that's, uh, that's produced. And it's so rare that it has such a high value and price. And there's some thinking that this may be referring to that. It's, there's, there's no doubt that the meaning here is, is referring to something that's rare. It's very hard to find. And so you think this is not, a virtue is not an everybody's doing it thing, is it? It's almost a nobody's doing it thing. And so that's what the indication is here. It may possibly be not just, it may not be a ruby as we know a ruby today. It could be even something even more rare, such as that pink pearl. I, I don't know. That's just something I found in trying to look at that and see what it has to say. Nevertheless, the point is the virtuous woman is extremely rare. So if you want to be someone that uh, is not like everybody else, you desire to be virtuous. Secondly, we find that the virtuous woman is trustworthy. Look at verse 11 and 12. And her, the heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Husbands, do we trust our wives that way? Do we trust our wives that they are, that we don't worry about them when we go off to work, are they doing everything like we want them to do? We need to think about that. The virtuous woman, if we believe our wives are virtuous, then we will trust them. They are trustworthy. <coughs> well, you can be trustworthy and still not do anything. <laughs> uh, or unless you are not trusted to take care of the house or what have you. No, that's not at all. But this woman, this virtuous woman described here, is not only rare, is not only trustworthy, but she is industrious. Look at verse 13. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. I see, I have to interject something. I cannot read that word. Every time I read it, I think about the, uh, the uh, it was, a, I can't remember all, all the particulars to it. It was talking about the, the firemen because uh, um, this is a book, this is a passage about firemen because they came from afar. You know, it's just uh, somebody had some joke about that. Every time I see that word, it's like the southern way of saying fire. But and it goes to my head every time. I'm sorry to interject that. You may have to edit that out, Jason. It has no meaning in what we're talking about today. Now that's rich. <laughs> anyway, cut that out. I'll forget about that. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth the field and buyeth it, and the fruit of her hands she planteth the vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. I mean, this is just incredible. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the staff. That woman is extremely industrious. A virtuous woman does not waste time. She keeps herself busy. I just marvel at some of these descriptions here. How many of you ladies think you can do all that? <laughs> and that's not the point here. The point here is being industrious and, and managing things at home while your husband's out of the way trying to produce the income to, 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 for the family to exist and live. And so you're being industrious. That's not saying you've got to do, do all these specific things that are up here. But are you industrious? Are you busy? There's nothing wrong with having a little downtime. We need that because the principle is given there with the six days of creation, the seventh day of rest. So there is proper rest at times. And a woman's job seemingly is never done at home, especially with kids. But at the same time, you know, we are to be busy about doing things that bring honor to our husband. And that's what that's what is being said here. A virtuous woman is well, not only that, it doesn't, it doesn't even end there. Because, let's move on to verse 20, because it says here that this virtuous woman is compassionate. You can be busy about things sometimes and be very industrious and overlook the needs around you, those that are truly in need. And then make your, not making yourself available for those that need to be counseled or need to be helped in some way. Uh, this woman wasn't that way. She was busy, yet she was compassionate. Look at verse 20. She stretched out her hand to the poor. 
Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. What an incredible trait. This woman, yet so busy, being entrusted by her husband to take care of things around the home, never loses sight of the compassion that we're to have. You know, Psalm 41 talks about our attitude toward the poor. And here, of course, what God said it just came to me. It's now Psalm 41, verse 1. Psalm says here, Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. I tell you, folks, what a principle it is to be compassionate. God's word says and promises that we'll be delivered in time of trouble if we're considering the poor. That doesn't mean we think about it. We just give them thoughts in our, and as I, oh, I hear this phrase so much today, my thoughts and prayers are with you. I'm so sick of it. It's such a trivial thing. I don't believe that anything beyond thoughts are with them in so many cases. When these people say these meaningless phrases, their prayers, uh, you know, I'm not saying it's always the case, but I would say in a lot of cases, their thoughts might be with them just fleetingly, but I don't believe their prayers are with them. I just don't get that. It comes, it comes across, across very trivially when people say that. Uh, and so well, that's, that's a sidetrack. But even, nevertheless, our thoughts and our prayers are not enough. For the poor, are we doing anything? James talks about the active ex uh, expression of our faith. He talks about seeing a person in need. If we say, go be warm and be filled, what profit is it? It's nothing. No profit at all, brothers and sisters, if we don't reach out to help. God's Word says there in that passage, that He will bless those that consider the poor. That means not just think about it. It goes out and does something about it. You sense it. You see it. And you see how we can help and give of our resources when those times come. God will bless those who do that. Well, the virtuous woman is rare. She's trustworthy. She's industrious. She's compassionate. She's also diligent. Look at verses 21 to 22. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and cotton. She's diligent to make sure the family is taken care of. She's not afraid of the snow. Many of us have that little things. My dad used to say, 19 drops of rain will keep 20 Baptists away from church on Wednesday night. <laughs> and yet we have, a, we have a virtuous woman described as one that's not afraid of the snow. Interesting, isn't it? Well, not only, look, not only, oh, these are such great attributes. Look, at there, there are nine of them all together. The next one is the virtuous woman brings honor to her husband. Look at verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. What is he known as? What do you think? What is he known as? Oh, you great man. And they sit there and they're pontificating. No. He's known as who he is because he's got a virtuous wife. And that's how we're going to be known, men, by our virtuous wives. You might think it's going to be the cause of us. But there's not a virtuous wife there behind us, behind the scenes, so to speak. Testimony's incomplete. In fact, Proverbs 12, 4 says a virtuous woman is a crowd. To her husband. The ladies, being virtuous is beneficial. It brings honor to your husband. It's a crown to your husband. <coughs> the seventh one is the virtuous woman is full of strength and honor. Verse 25. Strength and honor are her clothing. And she shall rejoice in time to come. Oh, we need our women to be strong and full of honor. And that's what a virtuous woman is. Someone <coughs> that doesn't wilt under the pressure. That can't be there when the family needs it. A motherly, uh, motherly attention is so unique. It's different from a, to a child. You know, I was a child once, children, believe it or not. I, mean, I, I actually was a child. 
But I remember, you know, it's, it's something different about a mother's care versus a father's care. You guys, uh, all of y'all can, men and women can, can uh, agree with that, I'm sure. There's something different. Mother's tender loving care is something special about that. And there's a there's strength and honor in that. When you're a child, then you want mother, there's that strength and that honor there. Any mother. And I know some have had a rough situation with mothers that haven't been there. Sad to say that not everyone has been blessed that way. I was blessed with one. I miss her greatly. 15 years she's been gone. But she was a woman of strength and a woman of honor. And I miss her. I thank God for Jesus who has fulfilled that role in my life since my mother's passing. And who is the same? Who is that very same thing to me? A woman of strength, a woman of honor. And I pray to God. Take the name for it. It'll take a dollar and a half, as Barney said. A dollar and a quarter, I think he said four. No, I wouldn't take anything for it. But not only is that woman full of strength and honor, she is full of wisdom and kindness. Look what it says in verse 26. She opened her mouth with wisdom, and her tongue was the law of kindness. My virtuous woman has so many characteristics. But wisdom and kindness. Coming from these ladies, as you open your mouth to speak, <coughs> and finally, in this first section, the virtuous woman is not idle. Verse 27, she looketh well for the ways of her household, and she did not the bread of idleness. Well, nine characteristics there. As, as we find the virtuous woman being described. Rare, trustworthy, industrious, compassionate, diligent, <coughs> brings honor to her husband, full of strength and honor, full of wisdom and kindness, and she's not idle. What about this morning? Can that be said about you ladies? As wives, those in, even those that are aspiring that later on in life. This is something to, to, to desire to be pattern given to us in God's Word. Well, not only is the word virtuous woman described, the virtuous woman is praised. You don't see the popular woman praised in Scripture. In fact, uh, we see it written in the New Testament that the, the adorning of, our, of yourselves as ladies should not be by the braided hair and all these other things. Those are fine, but that should not be the main adorning. It's a spiritual adorning. It's emphasized how we're to adorn ourselves with the Word of God and the truth. But the word virtuous woman is, uh, on the contrary, praised in God's Word. And let's look at these last four verses in this chapter, because I love what it says here. Verse 28, the first part of it tells us that her, virt her virtue, or virtuousness is another word that can be used, brings blessing from her children. Look at verse 28a. Her children arise up and called her blessed. When I read that, I thought some of you uh, mothers here today would wish some of your children just do that, don't you? <laughs> I'm waiting for them to rise up and call me blessed. They're little right now. But you know what? I can tell you from experience as a child who is, um, some would say, has never grown up, but has grown <laughs> up and got to be an old man now. I look back on things a little differently. And it was amazing how, when I got to be an adult and on my own, how quickly my parents got smarter. You didn't think we, I didn't think they knew as much as I did when I was in my teens, and they were supporting me and paying my bills. And, you know, they were feeding me. They were providing my place to stay. And yet I knew so much. But when I got out on my own, mm -mm -mm, I found out. I lived on my own about three years before I met Teresa, and so. I found out real quickly they did a few things that uh, I didn't give them credit for. Either they had read a lot of books you know, in that three years time and got smart real quickly and caught up with it, or they knew it all along and I just didn't, uh, I rebelled. And I think the latter is true. But, children, but, but uh, mothers do not give up hope. Their, their children will rise up and call you blessed. If you'll be virtuous, take on these characteristics, the end result is going to be that you will virtuous woman brings that praise. Well, not only does she, uh, her, her uh, 
virtuousness bring praise, blessing from her children. Her virtuousness brings praise from her husband. What does it say in the same verse? Her husband also will rise in the call of blessed. That's what that means to say. And he prays it for her. Husbands, that's our part of our responsibility there is to make sure we praise her. The virtue. She tries to be virtuous in every aspect. We are responsible and we, we must encourage her. And it will, it should result in that if the husband is right with God. That same virtue uh, excels all other attributes. Look in verse 29. My daughters, many daughters rather, have done well virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Make this an indication here of how important being a woman of virtue is. It excels those other attributes. It is at the top. Are you that person that can be described here as thou excellest them all? My, my. What an incredible description of a virtuous woman. Well, and the final two things in this part this morning. Her virtuousness results from fearing the Lord. I love verse. Favor is deceit. Young ladies, think about this. When you're trying to make yourself the most beautiful around, there's nothing wrong with adorning ourselves in, in, uh, in service to God, to be pleasing to God, not coming in here with your hair not brushed or, or not taking a bath. Now, we don't do that. That's what we're talking about here. But putting all our emphasis on these outward appearances so that our heart is not in tune with God's Word. It says here, those things about it, that alone is what you do. Favor, which means popularity, those that, that, that like you a lot, is deceitful. So Proverbs sp speaks of those that uh, we should not desire to, to have because uh, the truth of the friends will pierce the heart. But those that are not true friends speak deceit and all the flattery, words. And so it means nothing. <coughs> so when, they, when the bad times come, they flee. Oh my, I'm telling you what, we found that out in our lives years ago. Things happened to us. We found out who all fled. We knew who, who people were. The people in this room were the friends during those times. And you guys were the ones that did. So few others came alongside at all. The favor is deceitful. And not only is that popularity, is, it, it deceives you because people like you when, it's, when everything's going well. Or they'll like you as long as you're paying uh, for them to go some, uh, with you on trips or go out to eat, you're always paying the bill, they'll like you. Well, watch what happens when you stop doing that. Mm -hmm. They'll find somebody else to do it. And beauty is vain. Mm. Trying to make the outward appearance the most important thing in your life is vanity. Solomon speaks of that in the book of Ecclesiastes. These things are vanity of vanities. These things are just vanity. They're going to pass away. And young ladies, uh, you're going to get old like some of the rest of us someday. There might be a few little changes in that with appearance that are going to happen. But you can't do anything about it. But are God's words here giving you a way in which you still need to do all the days of your life? And it has nothing to do with favor. and has nothing to do with beauty on the outward appearance. Favor is deceitful. And beauty is vain. But what? The woman, a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Mm. The virtuous woman, those, that, those attitudes of being virtuous result and they come from fearing the Lord. So there is the foundation. You cannot fear the Lord without knowing the Lord. Very important to know Him. That's what we're kind of sandwiching in between these two messages this last week and next week on Colossians 2. How important it is to know the Lord. We have to know Him in order to know His Word. You can't understand it. And so in order to do that, we see His Word, we understand it, and we understand how important it is to fear the Lord. We talked about that in a little more depth last week. That results. If you want to be virtuous, you can't have it. If you do not fear the Lord, it'll be all bad. It'll be all superficial. And then the fifth item, our fifth point under this virtuous woman praise, 
is her virtue or her virtuousness will bring praise from those around her. Verse 31. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. And when I hear people today, and it's a hard thing to avoid, especially for men, is, the, is to have a claim given to themselves. And sometimes we want to is praise ourselves. Uh, Proverbs talks about that. And it says, uh, let other men praise thee, not thine own lips. Mm-hmm. And I think you know, there's a verse that I wanted to send to our president so bad that all the good things that he's done, I wish he could understand the truth of that word. You don't need to praise yourself. Just do those right things. And that's a that's good. And it's hard for him, and it's hard for all of us as men, especially. And it may be hard for some of you women as well, too, as well. What we have to do is it says here, let, and the women is talking about here, but we are as well, let other men praise us and not our own lips. Let her own works praise her in the gates. Ladies, you don't need to say anything about it. If you're virtuous, it'll be known. It can't help but be known because it's so rare and it's not seen everywhere. Well, even though it's 1229 a day. <laughs> We've uh, touched on three points about the virtuous woman. Uh, the first one having to do with uh, the virtuous woman is described. The virtuous woman then uh, praised. And now let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 5 and talk about briefly uh, the virtuous woman supporting men. I'm glad you stayed. <laughs> Because we've got a responsibility here. If we want our wives to be virtuous, it's dependent upon us. It cannot happen unless we help it happen. Okay? Very important to see this. We want to look at what he has to say. Just uh, a few short verses here in Ephesians chapter 5, 5 verses beginning with verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy, that he should be holy and without, or excuse me, I can't see it too well here, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherishes it, cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Well, the virtuous woman supported. There are four things about this I want us to take with us today. Number one, her husband loves her above all Women, your desire to be virtuous is thus your desire. But you need for us men, husbands, to be what's described here in all these verses to encourage you to be that way. What does it say here? The first part of verse 25, plain and simple. Husbands, love your wives. And the, the, the inference there is love your own wives, not somebody else's wives. Okay, I'm going to put that clarity <clears throat> Love your wives. It's not love your wives as in uh, a plurality of wives per person. We're talking about men in plural, love your wives, singular to singular. Okay, uh, what do you know? There's an error in God's word that talks about the, uh, polygamy. And, uh, no, it does not. It does not. Hus- uh, husbands, plain and simple, we are to love our wives. We love a person. One that, that supports, a husband that supports a virtuous wife will love her above all else. Well, you love her? You love your wife? You love her above all else? Is she number one on this earth? Not your children? No, no, no. Why is she number one on this earth? If not, well, you got to do something. 
she can't be virtuous if you don't love her above all else. Secondly, look, her husband protects her. <clears throat> look at what it says in just in this same verse. Even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Christ is our protector. Not only is not only our sacrifice, but he protects the church. He gave himself totally for us. We are to protect our wives. We're to be there for her. She's going through difficulties. Are we there? Do we listen? Are we ready to listen? I have not always listened. I've been too busy sometimes in my past life. And hopefully I've learned that and learned to try to be better listener over the last several years of our marriage. We need to listen. Women have a lot to say and they need us. And ultimately, uh, we're supposed to be more than just a man living in the house that helps with producing children and offspring. No, we're to be there in more ways than one. We're to love her above all else. And we're to protect her. We're to be there for her. And listen to her in every way. Well, thirdly, her husband is her spiritual leader. There's an umbrella of protection. God's Word lays out. I won't go into all the details of that, but basically it is this. We have God. Under that umbrella, He's designed it this way. I didn't do it. And women, it's really a, it's, it brings you a sense of security. It should. Because underneath that is the husband. And the husband is responsible. He answers to God directly for everything underneath him. Because under His umbrella of protection comes the wife next. That's not saying she's not an equal in person. There are roles to find in God's Word. And so, ladies, you're, you're quite protected because if things don't go right, if the husband's not in the right relationship with God, that's why the problem is in the hat and the hole. It's not your fault. <coughs> you can contribute to it, but ultimately your, your spiritual head is out from under the umbrella of protection of God. And when that husband gets out from under the, that protection of God, there are problems on the right. And that can be through so many various things. Not living according to God's Word. And we as men must be, and husbands must be conscious of that fact. We are her spiritual leader. And under, under her, you know, it branches out to the children. But it's so important to understand that. I mean, if we want her to be virtuous, we must be the spiritual leader. Well, how are we the spiritual leader as described here? There are two ways. How does he do that? He sanctifies her by the word. Sets her apart. Makes her special. She's set apart by the word of God. And that comes through, through God, through us, to her. And secondly, he cleanses her by the word. The word of God convicts. And as it convicts him of his sin, and he seeks to be cleansed of the Lord, it helps to cleanse her as well. You see, but not so, quite so important. And husbands, we must be those spiritual leaders. We're a leader in our home, whether it's spiritual or not. Don't, don't, don't think that we're not. And when we're not the spiritual leader, sometimes the women out of frustration try to usurp that authority, and then that's when things fall apart. And because women are disgusted with the whole lousy, good-for-nothing husband and won't be the spiritual leader, and they try to step into that role, that's when things fall apart. That's why we have women pastors in a lot of churches today violating the, the principle of God's Word in 1 Timothy because of that very thing, men have sat back and done nothing. They've not been the spiritual leaders in their home. They've not been spiritual leaders, period. They've not even been spiritual. And as a result of that, women have tried to take that authority on their own. And thus that has made things even worse. And so it's very important for us as husbands to love our wives above all else, to protect her, or to be her spiritual leader. And he loves her as much as he loves himself. You say, oh, I hate myself. Oh, you don't. You feed yourself every day. If we hated ourselves, we'd starve ourselves to death, wouldn't we? Oh, we make sure we're okay. If we get hurt, we're going to take, go to the doctor. We're going to take care of ourselves. Make sure we're all right. Do we love our wives as much as we love ourselves? I thought about an analogy here. I thought about, uh, it, you know, say, say, Wife goes somewhere and, and she's driving the car and she has a wreck somewhere. What is it? You can evidence how important uh, she is to you. Uh, how much do you love her? Well, when she calls you to tell you she's had an accident, what is your first reaction? I always say, oh, what's the car? Did you mess up the car? Well, 
what happens a lot today. The woman loves, or the man loves his vehicle more than he loves his wife. A lot of cases that's true. Man has a certain thing he loves. It's his. It's his own man cave, I guess, some people have, or something like that. It's his his big thing. He loves that more than he does his wife. Oh, I'm telling you today. No, absolutely not. We are to love her as much as we love ourselves. And the husband, in, in, those, in doing so, there are three things in verses 28 and 29 uh, about this that it says here. First of all, he should take care of her. Verse 28. So men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. We are to take care of her. Her. Not her taking care of us. We are to take care of her. Husbands, do you take care of your wife? Looking out after. Verse 29 tells us the other two. One of them is he should nourish her. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh. Nourish. So when you come and want to try to convince me that you don't like yourself, I will. I won't convince you the same thing is because I do. I'll make sure I love you. I'll eat. I'll nourish myself. But he nourish her. That's not just going there holding a spoon and feet her. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> Do you nourish her? Do you, are you there to feed her even with the word of God? With your love, care, and concern, and compassion for her. Your desire to be there. Are you nourishing her? Nourishing does what? It brings growth. If you're not nourishing her, how can she grow to be virtuous? It cannot be. Unless you nourish her, unless I nourish her. So the question is pretty serious one for us husbands today. As many of these are, are we nourishing our wives? And then he says in verse 29, this, the rest of that, but nourish it and what? Cherish it, even as the Lord the church. <coughs> you cherish your wife. <coughs> She's the most precious thing on this earth. What about this woman? <clears throat> virtuous woman. To be the virtuous needs to be supported. And the ways that God's word lays up forth in this passage of scripture tells us that we as husbands have great responsibility. If we want our wives to be virtuous, God, we've got the big responsibility here. Because if we don't do this, if we don't love her above all else, if we don't protect her, if we're not her spiritual leader, if we don't uh, take care of her, nourish and cherish her, she, how can we expect her to be virtuous? She can't be. There's no way. So the challenge today, husbands, is to us as well. Well, ladies, are you striving to be virtuous? If not, It's not too late to start. Now, God's word says it's, re it's better to be virtuous, as described here back in uh, Proverbs chapter 31. And we're given that description that beauty is, favor is deceitful, right? R uh, rather, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but the woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. It's better to be virtuous than to be otherwise. In fact, Proverbs 6.24 describes an, an evil woman. Proverbs 9.13 describes the foolish woman. Proverbs 21.9 describes the brawling woman. Proverbs 21.19 describes a contentious woman. And Proverbs 30, uh, verse, uh, 30 verses 21 through 23 describe the odious or the hateful woman. You want to be like that? I can't imagine you would. But I trust today that each of you women women here today, and even though you know, young ladies, as you grow up, your desire will be to be a virtuous woman that's described in this passage of Scripture. Well, men, are you loving your wives as Christ loved the church? I heard someone say a long time ago, this is so absurd. They asked him if he loved, if he loved his wife. He said, uh, I told her when the day we got married, I love her. And if, he, and if anything changed down the road, I'll let her know. 
I don't think any of our like that either. <laughs> Praise <laughs> God for that. Uh, we'll have to have an attitude adjustment here in, in this church if they're in a like that here. Are you loving your wives as Christ loved the church? <clears throat> Are you telling her you love her every single day? You know, we don't know when our time is up. It's a point man wants to die. We, it is already said. God knows. We don't know that last time that we go off our separate ways that maybe the last time we see it, see our, uh, our wives and our husbands. Husbands, if you tell them that you love her every day, maybe you last. Don't even know that. Are you being the spiritual leader? Not just in name, husbands. Do we pray with our wives? Are we there to help counsel them through difficulties? Are we sharing the scripture with them? Are we being their spiritual leader? And are you sanctifying, cleansing her by the word of God? Well, it's one thing to sit there and talk about things and to be up, uh, just, I'm so sorry and all this. But without the cleansing that can be sanctified, that will set those times apart based on Talk last week, one of the things I mentioned is I believe it's so true. Mary, for every situation we go through, as difficult as it may be, there is a principle in God's Word that will help us through that. And people try to deny that. Tell, oh, no, you can't. I challenge you. With any situation, God's Word gives us a principle. And so, if we're living that, and if we're doing, as I mentioned last week, we were talking about the 119th Psalm, if we're hiding God's, God's Word in our heart, the result of that will keep us from sin. But also, uh, and, and the result of that also, in, in hiding God's word in our heart, keep us from sin, but help us to know our Lord. Know Him, or well, know Him. That I may know Him, the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His Son, the ability to to His death. It cannot happen without us study, know it, meditate. So, don't miss Mother's Day. Ladies, our desire and God's desire is for you to be a virtuous. And men, husbands, God's desire for us is to be there and support that. And love her above all else, just as Christ loved the church. I hope that's true. If not, we've got something to work on as we go forward from here. Pray that that would be true. Happy Mother's Day to all of you. Dear mothers, we love you here in New Testament Christian Fellowship. You are special to us, and we see a lot of virtue in all of you. And our desire is that all of our ladies who desire to be virtuous, and all of our men who love their husbands. God be the Lord. For He is worthy to be praised. That's why. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for how it is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it pierces even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and even the intents of our heart. Lord, what a convicting power it has that no other book can have. And we thank you for the truths that we find there. Thank you for how you clearly lay out how virtue is so important, so rare, so lacking in this world today. But yet, it is something that you desire in all of us. So I pray that today, Lord, you would help us to have seen uh, in, these, in what you've laid out before us, that that should be what we desire to do. It's to be those walking virtuously. So I pray that you would help us to do that in the days ahead. May you convict us by your word. May you teach us by your word. And we truly live out these last days in accordance to it and be a light in a dark world today. <coughs> thank you for this time together. We thank you especially for our brothers and we honor today how precious they are. We pray that you continue to grow our mothers and our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord as the husbands seek to lead them as a spiritual leader. I 
bless the food we're about to partake of, to the nourishment of our body. We thank you uh, again for Robert and his family being with us today. And we just praise you for allowing that to happen. And give us a wonderful time of fellowship in the Lord and a restful afternoon today to prepare us for the appointment. In Jesus' precious.